Section 15 of An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals by David Hume. Appendix 1. Concerning Moral Sentiment. If the foregoing hypothesis be received, it will now be easy for us to determine the question first started, footnote, section 1, concerning the general principles of morals. And though we postponed the decision of that question, lest it should then involve us in intricate speculations which are unfit for moral discourses, we may resume it at present, and examine how far either reason or sentiment enters into all decisions of praise or censure. One principal foundation of moral praise being supposed to lie in the usefulness of any quality or action, it is evident that reason must enter for a considerable share in all decisions of this kind, since nothing but that faculty can instruct us in the tendency of qualities and actions, and point out their beneficial consequences to society and to their possessor. In many cases this is an affair liable to great controversy, doubts may arise, opposite interests may occur, and a preference must be given to one side, from very nice views, and a small overbalance of utility. This is particularly remarkable in questions with regard to justice, as is, indeed, natural to suppose, from the species of utility which attends this virtue. Footnote. See Appendix 2. End of footnote. Were every single instance of justice, like that of benevolence, useful to society, this would be a more simple state of the case, and seldom liable to great controversy. But as single instances of justice are often pernicious in their first and immediate tendency, and as the advantage to society results only from the observance of the general rule, and from the concurrence and combination of several persons in the same equitable conduct, the case here becomes more intricate and involved. The various circumstances of society, the various consequences of any practice, the various interests which may be proposed, these on many occasions are doubtful and subject to great discussion and inquiry. The object of municipal laws is to fix all the questions with regard to justice, the debates of civilians, the reflections of politicians, the precedents of history and public records are all directed to the same purpose, and a very accurate reason or judgment is often requisite to give the true determination amidst such intricate doubts arising from obscure or opposite utilities. But though reason, when fully assisted and improved, be sufficient to instruct us in the pernicious or useful tendency of qualities and actions, it is not alone sufficient to produce any moral blame or approbation. Utility is only a tendency to a certain end, and were the end totally indifferent to us, we should feel the same indifference towards the means. It is requisite a sentiment should here display itself in order to give a preference to the useful above the pernicious tendencies. This sentiment can be no other than a feeling for the happiness of mankind and a resentment of their misery, since these are the different ends which virtue and vice have a tendency to promote. Here, therefore, reason instructs us in the several tendencies of actions, and humanity makes a distinction in favour of those which are useful and beneficial. The partition between the faculties of understanding and sentiment, in all moral decisions, seems clear from the preceding hypothesis. But I shall suppose that hypothesis false. It will then be requisite to look out for some other theory that may be satisfactory, and I dare venture to affirm that none such will ever be found, so long as we suppose reason to be the sole source of morals. To prove this, it will be proper to weigh the five following considerations. 1. It is easy for a false hypothesis to maintain some appearance of truth, while it keeps wholly in generals, makes use of undefined terms, and employs comparisons instead of instances. This is particularly remarkable in that philosophy which ascribes the discernment of all moral distinctions to reason alone, without the concurrence of sentiment. 
it is impossible that, in any particular instance, this hypothesis can so much as be rendered intelligible, whatever specious figure it may make in general declamations and discourses. Examine the crime of ingratitude, for instance, which has place wherever we observe good will expressed and known, together with good offices performed on the one side, and a return of ill will or indifference with ill offices or neglect on the other. Anatomize all these circumstances, and examine by your reason alone in what consists the demerit or blame. You never will come to any issue or conclusion. Reason judges either of matter of fact or of relations. Inquire then, first, where is that matter of fact which we here call crime? Point it out. Determine the time of its existence. Describe its essence or nature. Explain the sense or faculty to which it discovers itself. It resides in the mind of the person who is ungrateful. He must, therefore, feel it and be conscious of it. But nothing is there except the passion of ill-will or absolute indifference. You cannot say that these, of themselves, always and in all circumstances, are crimes. No, they are only crimes when directed towards persons who have before expressed and displayed good-will towards us. Consequently, we may infer that the crime of ingratitude is not any particular individual fact, but arises from a complication of circumstances, which, being presented to the spectator, excites the sentiment of blame by the particular structure and fabric of his mind. This representation, you say, is false. Crime, indeed, consists not in a particular fact, of whose reality we are assured by reason, but it consists in certain moral relations, discovered by reason, in the same manner as we discover by reason the truths of geometry or algebra. But what are the relations, I ask, of which you here talk? In the case stated above, I see first good will and good offices in one person, then ill will and ill offices in the other. Between these there is a relation of contrariety. Does the crime consist in that relation? But suppose a person bore me ill will, or did me ill offices, and I in return were indifferent towards him, or did him good offices. Here is the same relation of contrariety, and yet my conduct is often highly laudable. Twist and turn this matter as much as you will, you can never rest the morality on relation, but must have recourse to the decisions of sentiment. When it is affirmed that two and three are equal to the half of ten, this relation of equality I understand perfectly. I conceive that if ten be divided into two parts, of which one has as many units as the other, and if any of these parts be compared to two added to three, it will contain as many units as that compound number. But when you draw thence a comparison to moral relations, I own that I am altogether at a loss to understand you. A moral action, a crime, such as ingratitude, is a complicated object. Does the morality consist in the relation of its parts to each other? How? After what manner? Specify the relation. Be more particular and explicit in your propositions, and you will easily see their falsehood. No, say you. The morality consists in the relation of actions to the rule of right, and they are denominated good or ill according as they agree or disagree with it. What, then, is this rule of right? In what does it consist? How is it determined? By reason, you say, which examines the moral relations of actions. So that moral relations are determined by the comparison of action to a rule, and the rule is determined by considering the moral relations of objects. Is this not fine reasoning? All this is metaphysics, you cry. That is enough. There needs nothing more to give a strong presumption of falsehood. Yes, reply I, here are metaphysics surely, but they are all on your side who advance an abstruse hypothesis, which can never be made intelligible, nor quadrate with any particular instance or illustration. 
the hypothesis which we embrace is plain it maintains that morality is determined by sentiment it gives virtue to be whatever mental action or quality gives to a spectator the pleasing sentiment of approbation and vice the contrary we then proceed to examine a plain matter of fact to wit what actions have this influence we consider all the circumstances in which these actions agree, and thence endeavour to extract some general observations with regard to these sentiments. If you call this metaphysics, and find anything abstruse here, you need only conclude that your turn of mind is not suited to the moral sciences. 2. When a man at any time deliberates concerning his own conduct, as whether he had better in a particular emergence assist a brother or a benefactor he must consider these separate relations with all the circumstances and situations of the persons in order to determine the superior duty and obligation and in order to determine the proportion of lines in any triangle it is necessary to examine the nature of that figure and the relation which its several parts bear to each other but notwithstanding this appearing similarity in the two cases there is at bottom an extreme difference between them a speculative reasoner concerning triangles or circles considers the several known and given relations of the parts of these figures and thence infers some unknown relation which is dependent on the former but in moral deliberations we must be acquainted beforehand with all the objects and all their relations to each other and from a comparison of the whole fix our choice or approbation no new fact to be ascertained no new relation to be discovered all the circumstances of the case are supposed to be laid before us ere we can fix any sentence of blame or approbation if any material circumstance be yet unknown or doubtful we must first employ our inquiry or intellectual faculties to assure us of it and must suspend for a time all moral decision or sentiment while we are ignorant whether a man were aggressor or not how can we determine whether the person who killed him be criminal or innocent but after every circumstance every relation is known the understanding has no further room to operate nor any object on which it could employ itself the approbation or blame which then ensues cannot be the work of the judgment but of the heart and is not a speculative proposition or affirmation, but an active feeling or sentiment. In the disquisitions of the understanding, from known circumstances and relations, we infer some new and unknown. In moral decisions, all the circumstances and relations must be previously known, and the mind, from the contemplation of the whole, feels some new impression or affection, or disgust, esteem or contempt, approbation or blame. Hence the great difference between a mistake of fact and one of right, and hence the reason why the one is commonly criminal and not the other. When Oedipus killed Laius, he was ignorant of the relation, and from circumstances innocent and involuntary formed erroneous opinions concerning the action which he committed. But when Nero killed Agrippina, all the relations between himself and the person, and all the circumstances of the fact, were previously known to him, but the motive of revenge, or fear, or interest, prevailed in his savage heart over the sentiments of duty and humanity. And when we express that detestation against him to which he himself in a little time became insensible, it is not that we see any relations of which he was ignorant, but that, for the rectitude of our disposition, we feel sentiments against which he was hardened from flattery and a long perseverance in the most enormous crimes in these sentiments then not in a discovery of relations of any kind do all moral determinations consist before we can pretend to form any decision of this kind everything must be known and ascertained on the side of the object or action nothing remains but to feel on our part some sentiment of blame or approbation whence we pronounce the action criminal or virtuous three this doctrine will become still more evident if we compare moral beauty with natural to which in many particulars it bears so near a resemblance it is on the proportion relation and position of parts that all natural beauty depends 
but it would be absurd thence to infer that the perception of beauty like that of truth in geometrical problems consists wholly in the perception of relations and was performed entirely by the understanding or intellectual faculties in all the sciences our mind from the known relations investigates the unknown but in all decisions of taste or external beauty all the relations are beforehand obvious to the eye and we thence proceed to feel a sentiment of complacency or disgust according to the nature of the object and disposition of our organs euclid has fully explained all the qualities of the circle but has not in any proposition said a word of its beauty the reason is evident the beauty is not a quality of the circle it lies not in any part of the line whose parts are equally distant from a common centre it is only the effect which that figure produces upon the mind whose peculiar fabric of structure renders it susceptible of such sentiments in vain would you look for it in the circle or seek it either by your senses or by mathematical reasoning in all the properties of that figure attend to palladio and perot while they explain all the parts and proportions of a pillar they talk of the cornice and frieze and base and entablature and shaft and architrave and give the description and position of each of these members but should you ask the description and position of its beauty they would readily reply that the beauty is not in any of the parts or members of a pillar but results from the whole when that complicated figure is presented to an intelligent mind susceptible to those finer sensations till such a spectator appear there is nothing but a figure of such particular dimensions and proportions from his sentiments alone arise its elegance and beauty again attend to cicero while he paints the crimes of a verres or a catiline you must acknowledge that the moral turpitude results in the same manner from the contemplation of the whole when presented to a being whose organs have such a particular structure and formation the orator may paint rage insolence barbarity on the one side meekness suffering sorrow innocence on the other but if you feel no indignation or compassion arise in you from this complication of circumstances you would in vain ask him in what consists the crime or villainy which he so vehemently exclaims against at what time or on what subject it first began to exist and what has a few months afterwards become of it when every disposition and thought of all the actors is totally altered or annihilated no satisfactory answer can be given to any of these questions upon the abstract hypothesis of morals and we must at last acknowledge that the crime or immorality is no particular fact or relation which can be the object of the understanding but arises entirely from the sentiment of disapprobation which by the structure of human nature we unavoidably feel on the apprehension of barbarity or treachery Four inanimate objects may bear to each other all the same relations which we observe in moral agents though the former can never be the object of love or hatred nor are consequently susceptible of merit or iniquity a young tree which overtops and destroys its parent stands in all the same relations which nero when he murdered agrippina and if morality consisted merely in relations would no doubt be equally criminal five it appears evident that the ultimate ends of human actions can never in any case be accounted for by reason but recommend themselves entirely to the sentiments and affections of mankind without any dependence on the intellectual faculties ask a man why he uses exercise he will answer because he desires to keep his health if you then inquire why he desires health he will readily reply because sickness is painful if you push your inquiries farther and desire a reason why he hates pain it is impossible he can ever give any this is an ultimate end and is never referred to any other object perhaps to your second question why he desires health he may also reply it is necessary for the exercise of his calling if you ask why he is anxious on that head he will answer because he desires to get money if you demand why it is the instrument of pleasure says he and beyond this 
it is an absurdity to ask for a reason it is impossible there can be a progress in infinitum and that one thing can always be a reason why another is desired something must be desirable on its own account and because of its immediate accord or agreement with human sentiment and affection now as virtue is an end and is desirable on its own account without fee and reward merely for the immediate satisfaction which it conveys it is requisite that there should be some sentiment which it touches some internal taste or feeling or whatever you may please to call it which distinguishes moral good and evil and which embraces the one and rejects the other thus the distinct boundaries and offices of reason and of taste are easily ascertained the former conveys the knowledge of truth and falsehood the latter gives the sentiment of beauty and deformity vice and virtue the one discovers objects as they really stand in nature without addition and diminution the other has a productive faculty and gilding or staining all natural objects with the colours borrowed from internal sentiment raises in a manner a new creation reason being cool and disengaged is no motive to action and directs only the impulse received from appetite or inclination by showing us the means of attaining happiness or avoiding misery taste as it gives pleasure or pain and thereby constitutes happiness or misery becomes a motive to action and is the first spring or impulse to desire and volition from circumstances and relations known or supposed the former leads us to the discovery of the concealed and unknown after all circumstances and relations are laid before us the latter makes us feel from the whole a new sentiment of blame or approbation the standard of the one being founded on the nature of things is eternal and inflexible even by the will of the supreme being the standard of the other arising from the eternal frame and constitution of animals is ultimately derived from that supreme will which bestowed on each being its peculiar nature and arranged the several classes and orders of existence end of appendix one end of section fifteen